Okay. Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Well, it's always a pleasure to be here on uh, the Monday morning uh, program in the spring. I see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, I thought this year I would talk about Central Asia. I went there last um, April, and uh, March and April, April. And so I'm gonna talk about, I'm not a Central Asian expert. I'm a world geographer. I've, I've spent most of my time in East Asia, but I teach about, about the world. And so I'm gonna uh, today give you a little bit of an academic lecture on Central Asia. Then we're gonna look at some pictures of uh, uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Um, and, and talk about those. Has anybody been to Central Asia before? Okay, all right. Well, uh, please chime in when, uh, when we have a question and answer period if you've got some, some reactions and interests or stories to share. Um, this, this, um, this picture, um, for me, encapsulated the trip to, uh, to Uzbekistan. There was incredible excitement when I was there. Uh, Uzbekistan, um, just recently got a new president. And they had one that had been for a long time and it was quite a repressive place. And I arrived there last year and the new president was uh, opening up uh, in, in, in encouraging uh, foreigners to come into the country, encouraging connections between uh, other, other stands. And it happened to be the time I was there he also got all these buses to take people from the countryside and bring them to the, the beautiful sites of the nation that they had never seen. The people travel around the world to go see it. So actually the sites were packed. But it was so much fun to be there with people who, who were so exuberant. They, they were trying to get in to see this place and a couple of people saw that I was looking at them and so they waved and I took their picture and anyway. Um, so, Central Asia. It's an area that a lot of people are not familiar with, um, particularly uh, Americans. And so um, we've got Kazakhstan in the north, and there's Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and um, uh, Turkmenistan. Some people also consider Afghanistan and Pakistan part of Central Asia. Um, this is kind of the, the Central Asia I'm going to talk about today. but. Um, there we go, another, another uh, look at it in the world. Here is another uh, um, uh, uh, definition. We're now Afghanistan. So here are the, here there's Kazakhstan, here are the, the, the stands I talked about. So some people have included Afghanistan in this one. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, some images of Central Asia from space. And there's a couple of things we need to, we need to actually uh, um, look at. I'm sorry. This, oh, I got a pointer. Um, this lake here. So here's, first, Kazakhstan is the ninth largest country in the world. It's a very big country. It's got a lot of resources. Um, and, uh, but I want you to, here's the Aral Sea as it's often uh, uh, cartographically drawn on maps, but it is almost non-existent. And then here is the Caspian Sea. So we're going to look at some imagery. Remember those, those, those points? Yeah, the Aral Sea uh, has dried up almost completely, one of the, the global changes. So this is, this is the combination of about 1,000 satellite images. There's a, this MODIS sensor that circles the Earth, images the Earth every day, and, and they take the days without any clouds. There's often lots of clouds. And here is, here's that, here's that lake that we, I had you look at. Here's the Aral Sea, there's a little bit of it left. And there's the Caspian Sea. So we're, we're talking about this area here. It's very dry, uh, arid, semi-arid. There is, there is some uh, growth along the edge. There's some uh, rivers that flow, and you can see some agriculture going there. There's also some rivers that flow out of the Himalayas, and there's agriculture here. Um, the water that used to flow out of the Himalayas and the Tian Shan Mountains used to flow into the Aral Sea and it used to be this inland sea, but because of agriculture and some climate change, the water doesn't get there anymore. Um, and that's one reason why it's shrinking. This lake here is in, 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 in Kyrgyzstan. It's right next to, uh, we're gonna go to Almaty in Kazakhstan here, right near that lake.
All right, I got the clicker. Winter time. So, um, northern, 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 northern Kazakhstan is is cold. It's snowy uh, in the winter. Uh, minus forty often. Um, some of the snows come down out of the out of the out of the mountains. This area. One one key thing about this area has been physically isolated from a lot of the world. You've got this, this barren, cold north. You've got these incredible mountainous region uh, between China and this region. You also have these incredible mountainous regions down here as well as, as, as desert. And then you've got uh, a sea on this side. So it's been, it's been isolated. And from various times in history, one area will have access to it. So for a while, uh, Persia had access to it. For a while, China had access to it. Uh, there were lots of trades that, traders that went through this region. Another time, uh, Russia came down and took control of this region and incorporated it into the Soviet Union. So it's been this crossroads uh, for, for millennia of different regions grabbing it for a while, and then it gets isolated again. Closer version. So here we've got here we there's the uh, Aral Sea again that, that's that's shrinking. Um, there's that lake. So this is in the winter time. Um, here's in Afghanistan this incredibly high elevated rough area. Look at the, ter uh, the look at the terrain. This is Pakistan, and there's so India the Indian subcontinent actually is still plowing into Eurasia. And in the process of plowing in, it's, it's created the Himalayas and it's created this contortion of mountains that really keeps this area isolated. And, and the, the, the high mountains and snow uh, keeps China. This is Xinjiang province, uh, isolated from the region. So uh, this is the region at night, and so we've got India down here, we've got the Pakistan and Indus River here, Afghanistan, here's much of, of uh, Central Asia. Along the edge of the mountains where there's water, that's the key thing if you map out where there's water is where you're going to find the population. And so there's water along the edge of those mountains. Here's up in, here's up in Russia much more well developed. You've got the Trans-Siberian Railroad that has lots of uh, uh, things off of it. This is Tibet. Um, this is Mongolia. <laughs> this is North Korea. Uh, it looks, the South Korea, this is the island called South Korea. So, this is, this is a, um, a map I did. So uh, one of my uh, works, so I use satellites to study the Earth, that's my main area of specialty, and vegetation. And so I looked at global photosynthesis. And so this red means the bottom 20% of, of photosynthetic activity. Here's the top 20%, the bright greens. Do you find that in the Amazon? You actually find it in the southwest of the U.S. But there's not a lot of vegetation, not a lot of growth because it's very arid this region. Also notice, notice Tibet's very arid also, not a lot of growth, and uh, Xinjiang is not, and there's a little bit of Mongolia here with uh, the Gobi Desert. So Taklamakan Desert's here, the Gobi Desert's here. This is, this is called a cartogram. And a, normally when we look at a map, the size of a country is related to how much land area it has. That's the co most common map. This, the size of the country is related to how many people are in that country. Uh, and uh, I'm going to say this is probably about 10 years ago maybe. So we've got a huge amount of people in China, huge, large Japanese population, large Indian population. Uh, this is Iran. And this is Afghanistan, and this is, is, is Central Asia. Even though, even though Kazakhstan is the ninth largest country by land area, it's not a lot of people. Uh, so this region, uh, it, it's isolated, not a large population relative to the rest of the world. So here is, here is, there's, there's that. Remember we showed the agricultural area just before the Aral Sea? 
and there's some other agriculture going in this direction. This is the base of the mountains where water runs off from glaciers. And then you've got, remember that, that the Russian uh, uh, cities up here. Here's another, here's another, another uh, uh, description of Central Asia, and they include this area over here, the Caucasus. Um, so some, some geographers include that. Here is, here's another uh, 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 map of the region, and we've got, we've got those five stands that I called off at the beginning. We've got the Caucasus region, we've got Afghanistan, we've got Tibet added, we've got Xinjiang added, we've got Mongolia and Inner Mongolia added. And um, so actually, actually, um, culturally, uh, environmentally, um, these areas are fairly similar with each other. Uh, they're arid and semi-arid, and when you have, have semi-arid region, you often have nomadic people. When we can grow crops, we're settled, we grow the crops, and we're fairly prosperous. Semi-arid regions, the, the rainfall is so variable. Unless you've, got, unless you've got a water source you can irrigate, the grass grows. And when grass grows, we use animals to take that, that energy from the grass, and then we drink the milk, and we make butter and cheese, we eat the meat, and some places we eat the blood. So the way we can survive in a grassland is that nomadic lifestyle. The reason why it's nomadic is because rainfall is so irregular, you have to follow where the, where the rain goes. So actually, um, the people of, of Central Asia, except for in the settled agricultural areas, were very nomadic. Uh, Mongolians, very nomadic. Uh, people in, in Xinjiang, very nomadic. And people in, in Tibet, very nomadic as well. Um, Here's a climate map of the area, and it is including all those areas that, that uh, I talked about. Um, the yellow here is, 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 uh, is desert. This brown is more, um, let me get this right. Sorry, this is true desert. The yellow is semi-arid, which would be more grassland. So we've got some true desert here, true desert. H represents highlands, which is kind of a mixed climate. But notice, everywhere there's not a lot of precipitation um, throughout the year. Dry lands of, of, of Asia. Um, again, uh, this region here, fairly, fairly uh, um, dry. And then Xinjiang and, and Mongolia, dry. Topography. So again, you can kind of see how, how here's the border of Turkmenistan and Iran. It's, it's almost right along the, the foothills there. And it, the border really, it really, these mountains really do uh, uh, keep it isolated. Tibet's often called the third pole because it's so cold up there and there's lots of glaciers. That's a, that's a very high plateau. Population. So um, this is this is this is this is Inner Mongolia. This is Mongolia. Mongolia is the least densely populated country on Earth. There's more Mongolians living in Inner Mongolia. Many more Mongolians living in China than, than actually living in Mongolia. Um, anyway, here here's here's Central Asia. Afghanistan of all those has got a fairly high population, um, and it's just those irrigated areas. Uh, and near the mountains where you see the population. In China, there are all these oases that circle the desert. And so you get these large populations that used to be very isolated. But about two years ago, China finally finished its interstate highway where every county in China is now connected by, by a highway. They were so impressed with the uh, uh, highway system in the United States that they, they built it there to kind of unify the country. Um, oops. Here's a map and, and world religions and maps like these kind of distort our perception of things in part. So the green is, is, is the Islamic world um, and uh, it, is, it is 
predominantly uh, Muslim. But, Christian? not Christian, Muslim. Well, I'm just looking up in the map. <coughs> Christi purple. Christianity is the purple. I know. Christianity is the purple. So we've got, we've got uh, that there. But the green is Islam. And here's our Central Asian region. North of Central Asia is Christians? Yes, uh, uh, Russian Orthodox. Okay. Yeah, yep, yep. And in fact, there's a lot of Russians and there's Russian Orthodox in, in Central Asia. Um, and the, the percentage of, of Muslims drops off as you move, as you move uh, northward. So it is, it is uh, uh, in the 80s and then in the, in the 80s here and then in the 70s there and the f probably the 50s here. Where is Kashgar? Kashgar is over here in, in China, yeah, just over the mountains. Have you, have you been to Kashgar? Yes, but next to um, which stand is it? You know, I think it's in the top of the mountain desert. Well, it's along the mountains outside the desert, but next to the desert. Yes, yes. I don't know. I don't know the exact. The ex I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Kyrgyzstan, but I don't know for sure. Going the wrong direction. So here's an interesting thing. A lot, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people speak a, uh, a Turkish-related language. Um, although, although there are, are we've got Kazakh and we've got uh, Turkmen and we've got Uyghur languages. Uh, they're all this this Turkic relationship. Then. Persian. So here, here, uh, here's, here's Iran, Persia, here's Afghanistan, there's a lot of Persian speakers in Afghanistan, and Ta Tajikistan is mostly a Persian, Persian speaking language. And there are, there, are, there are a bunch of Tajiks who live in Uzbekistan, and, and Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, they're more of a, of a Turkish, they are a Turkish related language. So at one point you've got that Turkish influence, at another point you've got that Persian influence, in culture as well as in politics. And here is the ethnic map of the region. So even though there is uh, some uh, shared religion, some shared either, either Persian or Turkish language groups, there are these distinctive ethnic groups. And so uh, uh, Turkmenistan is primarily uh, the Turkmen population. What I find interesting is, is in northern Iraq, uh, north, uh, west Iran, you find the Kurds, but there's also, there's also a group of Kurds up here in Iran and in Turkmenistan. But mostly you just find Turkmen in Turkmenistan. Mostly you find Uzbeks in Uzbekistan, although there's the, these Tajiks that are in there and there's some Turkmen that, that cross the border. Um, Kyrgyzstan, mostly Kyrgyz. Um, Tajikistan, mostly uh, of Tajiks. Kazakhstan, you've got a mix of, 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 of Kazakhs, Russian, a lot of Russians. So this, this color here is Russian. And interestingly, these, um, this is an old map actually, these blue areas are German. There was a large German population in Kazakhstan. In the 1800s, a lot of Germans migrated into Russia for work and they settled in the Volga region. And then uh, a lot, I mean, a large population. And uh, right, a large population of Germans migrated to the United States. Um, and uh, at World War II, right, just like we, we, we interned Japanese people, the Germans were interned in, in Russia uh, because of the fear of, of Nazis, even though they spoke Russian and not German. And a lot of them were sent down, and also Stalin sent a lot of Germans down to Kazakhstan. When the Soviet Union fell apart, some of these, these Germans that, that didn't speak German but spoke Russian, some of them migrated to Germany and some have migrated back to Russia. Some have migrated to the United States. A lot of them have migrated up to, up to, to Russia again. Um, so a fair bit of mix, although the countries are, are pretty well defined with their own nationality internally. Just another map of the same. All right, 
so that is the end of the geography lesson. Uh, we will have the multiple, multiple choice quiz at the end of the show. <laughs> So, here is, uh, again, here's uh, Central Asia, and this is, this is, is Almaty. It used to be the capital of uh, Kazakhstan, and it was, it was created in the 1800s by Russia. So, um, in the 1800s, mid-1800s, Russia came down into Central Asia. Russia wanted to, to go all the way down to the Indian Ocean, wanted to have access to the Indian Ocean. The British did not want them to do that. The British had, uh, had uh, India and Pakistan, uh, uh, got Afghanistan, and then this, this little border was drawn uh, so that uh, the Russian uh, a place would not have direct contact with the, with the, the British uh, holdings. Um, so the, the Russians came down, they, they uh, set up the city Almaty, um, connected it with, with, with eventually with a rail line, it, when the Soviet Union fell apart, uh, and a lot of Russians lived down here, when, when the Soviet Union fell apart and there were some battles between those countries as they tried to, to rearrange the borders a little bit, um, Kazakhstan changed its border, or its capital city, from Almaty up here uh, to Astana because it wanted to exert itself. There are a lot of, remember that, that map we saw? There are a lot of ethnic Russians live up here. So they wanted to assert the fact this is the capital of Kazakhstan, not Russia, um, where, where the capital used to be way down here. A um, number of countries will do that. They'll move their capital forward to an area that they want to make sure stays in their country. Um, so that's what happened in Kazakhstan. But this is still, this is still the cultural uh, hearth. It's a, it's a beautiful city. And uh, what is it? Almaty, Almaty, Almaty. With an A? With an A, yep, yep. The reason why I went to Central Asia was um, last, uh, last spring I was on sabbatical and uh, a lot of my time was spent in China at, the, at Shanghai, Shanghai Normal University and since I was already in Asia there was this conference going on in Almaty about um, dry lands and I had just finished a research project with an Iranian colleague of the Middle East and, and how temperature and precipitation has been changing over the past two decades and then projecting into the future uh, what it's going to be like. And, and so there was this international conference. And uh, we sat around and presented papers. And they had uh, uh, people inside this little booth here who would, when it was in Russian and English, were the two languages. <laughs> most people in Kazakhstan speak Russian. Uh, most Kazakhs, their first language is Russian. The second one is, is Kazakh. During the Soviet era, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on becoming unified culturally, politically, economically, and so the language and religion and culture of the Kazakhs was, was suppressed. Now there's, there's a movement to resurrect the Kazakh culture. Um, so it was in Russian, and so when, you, when, you, when someone would give a speech in Russian, they would actually automatically translate it into English. Um, it was a conference uh, set up by the United Nations and uh, uh, Kazakhstan's National University. This is Almaty. Um, it is uh, uh, everything you see on the on the walls tends to be in Cyrillic. So the Kazakh language used Cyrillic characters to to translate it. They're now in the process of of changing their language from Cyrillic to Roman characters, the same characters we use. Um, there, most people, again, I said Russian's the, the main language. Not a lot of English. Um, they're, the, they're the Tian Shan Mountains. This is, this is in April. They'll have snow all year up on, up on top there. They get water from, the reason why the city's here because there's a lot of water drains out of those mountains. And so there's agricultural fields near here. So it's a very, uh, a very wealthy place. However, they, oh, they are uh, fossil fuel rich. Uh, of all the stands, Kazakhstan is the, the wealthiest. Unfortunately, they still use a lot of coal for, uh, for their electrical production. And it is, uh, coal, is, coal is a dirty fuel. 
not only does it put lots, tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's a lot of particulate matter. And unless you've got some sophisticated system to try to pull out those particulates, they're going out the smokestack and it is, it is uh, it's a polluted city, unfortunately. If you've ever been to a, a Russian city, it looks like a Russian city. Um, it's drab, um, but efficient and, and uh, kind of egalitarian. Uh, there's so much water. There's all, the, all through town, there are these canals. Uh, and sometimes they will be, they will be, be full uh, to drain. Flooding is a major, has always been a major problem in this, in this city. Um, so they've got all this intricate water network to get, uh, uh, to get the water out of the city. In many ways, it looks like, like anywhere USA, right? The bike share program is there. Um, this is the entrance to the subway. Uh, fashion, sometimes you go to a place, actually Uzbekistan, the fashion stood out, but in Kazakhstan, it looked like, looked like the US. Just like in Moscow, the subways are gorgeous. They're clean, they're efficient, they've got these chandeliers. Uh, they've got stained glass windows. That's the, that's the president, and so he's been, although he's, he is stepping down, he's been the president for decades. Um, and uh, you see his picture, like every dictator, you see their picture everywhere. Um, this is in the subway, uh, holding some beautiful flowers. You see a lot of Soviet art on top of buildings, in the parks. Um, you really, you really I do feel like you're in the Soviet Union. We, we, it was the Soviet Union. Here is, here is the memorial to uh, World War II. And a lot of Kazakhs fought in World War II with the Russians. And um, this is, is such a Soviet uh, 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 statue. It's, it, it, it's heavy, it's bold, it, it's, uh, um, and it's in the shape, oops, oops. It's in the shape of, of Russia. And here, here is uh, uh, Central Asia. And these are all the different people from all over, over, over the Soviet Union. I should say, not Russia, but Soviet Union. All over the Soviet Union together fighting. I'm going to show you the same um, World War II uh, statue in Uzbekistan in a little bit. So remember this. They also have a lighter side. This is, this is the only place in the world you can, sit in a, uh, you can sit with the Beatles in a statue and have your picture taken. <laughs> That's what they advertise it as. <laughs> it's kind of up on the hill. There's a little amusement park on one of the hills. This is in the, in the National Library, and um, there's a lot of this kind of art of this, this history of, of uh, nomads, uh, noble nomads, um, and a variety of very famous, uh, uh, famous people. Notice the, uh, right, the, oops, uh, the, the, the eagle or the hawk. There actually are a number of Kazakhs that live in China and Mongolia and have that share, I don't know if you've ever seen, if you've seen that movie or not about the, about the, the girl who uh, learns to fly, it's incredible. But they share a lot of that same uh, Mongolian, um, uh, right, the, they, their, a lot of their ancestry comes from Mongolia. Um, I'm sorry, what? Through Genghis Khan. What movie? I don't know the name of it, there's a movie out of, of a couple of movies actually, of a young girl it's a boy's thing, it's a men's thing to, to, fly those, to fly those eagles and her father teaches her and she becomes this, this master. Um, it was on PBS. It was on PBS. And really, it really delves into the culture pretty deeply. So, and also, this is very interesting too. They found a, a, a warrior uh, who's got this, uh, this golden suit. And um, so all around Kazakhstan, you see this image of, of the Golden Warrior. Turns out, from, from uh, archaeological evidence, um, the Golden Warrior was a woman, um, not a man. And yet, you never see, you never see her. You only see him. Um, you see him all over the place. There he is, the president. 
the president, the president, everybody's cheering everywhere you turn around. Um, so a bunch of these signs. And um, so I, uh, I, so I was, I was working with the university, and a person from the university took me around Almaty for the day. And the person was saying, so right now China has this program called Belt and Road. And they're having countries finance uh, railroads, power plants, highways, and they're, they're connecting all around the world. They're, 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 they're uh, uh, progressing through Southeast Asia. And they're moving through Central Asia, kind of creating this, the, the modern Silk Road over, over to Europe. And the Chinese are building these highways. And my, my Kazakh uh, guide said, you know, we trust the Chinese more than we trust our workers. Because we know our workers will just take most of the money and put it in their pocket and put less pavement down. But uh, the Chinese will, will, will be more truthful. And so there's a lot of bribery. And, and when, you, when you have right, a dictatorship and one person in power, one party in power, and China's got a lot of corruption itself, but, you, but it breeds corruption. And so now there's this big movement to try um, to stop corruption. Um, terrorism, worried about terrorism. Um, Uzbekistan has had some cases in the past. Um, be on the lookout. This is, in the, this is a sign in the subway. Um, telling people to, to be careful. Here's the market, uh, the, and, and um, it, is, it is filled with uh, hundreds and hundreds of stalls. Uh, each stall sells, sells one thing like shoes, uh, popcorn. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, Korean food. Uh, some kimchi, uh, all these pickled things. There's a lot of Koreans that live in Kazakhstan. Again, Stalin, uh, there are all those Koreans that lived in Russia right near Korea, forcibly moved a lot of them down to Central Asia. Mixed, Stalin mixed all kinds of ethnic groups into different places. So there's this large population of Korean, and um, most, of, well, I only talked to a couple of them. Um, most of them don't talk Korean with the family, they all just talk Russian. Um, but they've maintained this Korean culture and food. This is an Uzbek. Uh, the, the fruits and seeds uh, come from Uzbekistan, not Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is more of a, of a humid uh, uh, vegetable climate and, and, and cattle. These are different cheese products. All of those, all of those are, are different cheese products. Made from, oh, cool. I don't know. I don't know if it's cow or if it's. I would imagine there's some some goat and sheep and stuff. You always want to check the teeth out before you before you buy it. Um, they eat lots of meat. Meat is like a main, main and right nomads tend to meat tends to be a heavy heavy aspect of a diet. Meat and, meat and milk. Those, I didn't, I should have shown the picture. It, this, these stalls went way down, I mean, a lot of different milk products. Um, and a lot of meat. Um, there, there was, there was also, um, in, in, most of it, most of it's beef. Um, there's a lot of horse, eat a lot of horse. Um, horse meat, I found horse meat, um, Horse meat sausage, absolutely delicious. Um, and the uh, sheep and goat. And there was a small section uh, for pig. Because there are a lot of, although, although most people are Muslim, there is a large Russian population. And so uh, uh, I didn't see pig in Uzbekistan, but here I did. One, one thing about... Um, Kazakhstan was so they they um, in the university they really wanted to engage with the West. They uh, in fact there's this this feeling they've been dominated by the Soviet Union. They've been they're dominated by Russia now. They're they're all of their connections, their rail lines, their roads, um, their education, their language has been connected to Russia, 
and they are now changing their, their, their um, uh, language to Roman characters instead of Cyrillic. They're t per, uh, introducing English into, into uh, schools. They're going to start teaching uh, their master's programs in English. They want, to, they want to publish in Western journals because right now they publish in Soviet or Russian journals and they mostly just sit on the shelf. A lot of the, a lot of the academic world engages in English. Um, it was really interesting this, this, this kind of shift that's happening. And now the long-term president is going to step down. I don't know what, what uh, is going to, going to follow him. Uzbekistan did this maybe two decades before Kazakhstan started. Uzbekistan's already changed their, their uh, uh, writing to, to uh, Roman characters. They're a little bit more English spoken. Um, they've uh, um, moved away from, moved away from uh, Russia and not necessarily embrace the West, more actually embrace their, the Uzbek culture. Um, so I went, I went to, uh, so my, my business was in Kazakhstan and I thought since I'm so close to, to Uzbekistan, I contacted a local travel agency there and they put me on this trip with three other people. Um, and I went to uh, Tashkent, which is the capital, and then went to Kiva, Bukhara, and Samarkand. Um, and I'll show some pictures from there. The Samarkand is in Uzbekistan? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, these are, these are uh, uh, agricultural rich areas. This Fergana Valley, this is, the, this is one of the more densely populated places of Central Asia. Very, very fertile. A lot of, of fruit and nuts and stuff are, are grown here. Um, Uzbe Kazakhstan's the most wealthy country in Central Asia. They've got all this fossil fuel wealth and other mineral wealth. Uzbekistan's pretty poor. Uh, although they're, they're, they've got a lot of rich agriculture, um, a lot of, of, uh, of crafts, they've, they've, they're a pretty poor country. This is Tashkent, um, and it looks like looks a modern city. Um, a lot of, actually I, a lot of, uh, I think it were Chevys there. We had a Chevy plant in, in Uzbekistan. Um, yeah. <laughs> This is a lot of marble, a lot of beautifully carved marble buildings. Although, although I didn't get to Ashgabat in, in Turkmenistan, where almost every building is, is, is marble. What is that building? A library. Here is remnant, again, of, of, of a Soviet era. They built the Hotel Uzbekistan. Um, and. Uh, you know, you can, I, I lived in China in the mid-1980s, and you'd go to uh, fancy spots, and there'd always be photographers there to take your pictures because nobody had cameras. We all have cameras now, right, in our phones, but this place still um, had the local camera guy, and he's showing the different possible, possible pictures you could take. So you know it's poor country when at the, at the um, um, uh, beauty sites, people don't have their own camera. They've got to, they've got to hire a photographer. This is, so Tashkent had these little alleyways of, of kind of the old, old style. This is just the, the kid who sets up for, for, for his daily shop. This is a bakery and um, bread is, is a key, key aspect of the diet. And, and here's the oven. And they throw, they've got, the, they've got the, the, the gas heating, and they've got the bread on the side. And this bread, what's great, you can buy it and, and just have it for five days without having to, to wrap it up or anything. It's, it stayed, uh, stayed edible. This is, this is a, a drink, and I don't know what they, what they actually do with it. It's made from grass. I think it's wheat grass um, in the market. Halva, if you know halva, lots of, lots of sesame uh, uh, treats. This is, is similar to the, to the market in Kazakhstan, right? The uh, uh, Russians or Soviets set up these uh, centralized uh, uh, markets. 
Here's the different horse cuts, right? You go into the market and they show you the different beef cuts. Here are the different horse cuts. This, this is the uh, World War II memorial. So remember Kazakhstan, they used to have the same memorial of the Soviet Union, the big burly guy coming out, and they, they, they changed it for a much more solemn. The mother who is uh, uh, pining away for her son who went off to war and died. It's very, such a different feeling. It, it's, it, it really is reflective and somber, where that other one, I'm not quite sure what to make out of it. It's kind of like we're, 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 we're great. I did, forget to, I did forget to show you in, in Kazakhstan, not far from, not far from the Soviet uh, statue, they had, they had a uh, memorial to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. A lot of Kazakhs, when, when, when the Soviets controlled Afghanistan, a lot of Kazakhs were sent down there. A lot of people from Central Asia, right, because they're, they're, they're related to the, the people in Afghanistan. And uh, it, in, in, that was a very somber uh, kind of soldiers on bent knee, because it didn't, because that war didn't go well. Um, anyway, I thought that was that was such a uh, stark difference. A lot, a lot in in, in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan seemed like it has been in mothballs <coughs> for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, they've, they've, they've swept the mothballs away, and it is filled with these. That's a, that's a mosque in the background. Um, this is in Tashkent, the capital. Kids, kids playing. They were flying a kite. I guess you can't see the kite. Um, uh, out in front. This was, this was traditionally a madras, a school. So to my back is the mosque. And across from the mosque is, is the madras, the school. All over, all over Uzbekistan are these um, madrases. And it used to be a very highly educated uh, population. There were lots of them. Um, and beautiful. Here's, here's inside that madras. Courtyard. Educated? Yes, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to what extent there is variation. Um, I know I met actually. Um, I met. Uh, I'm actually, we're potentially starting up a program with with Kazakhstan, and the department leaders were all women that we that we interacted with, and so I and at the university in Kazakhstan. There were a lot of, lot of women in the university. I didn't go to any university in Uzbekistan, so I'm not, I'm not, not sure about that, but. Did the madrasas um, then and now have um, similar education or madrasas today are not well-founded education? I'm thinking it's very different uh, from, from then and now, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Look at all those shoes, right? Um, this, is, this is a mosque. You've got to take your shoes off. And some places you'll wash your feet before you go in. Um, and so, and there's crutches there. Someone left their crutches uh, behind as well. This is Kiva. This is, 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 a, is a town that's out towards the Aral Sea. It's right on the border of uh, Turkmenistan. And when I was there last April, they told me that they cannot make a phone call to relatives in Turkmenistan, that the border is so cut off between those two countries. And for a long time, Uzbekistan was very internal. There's a new president. In fact, a month after I was going to be there, they were sprucing the place up. The Uzbek president was inviting the Turkmen president to come to Kiva and talk about opening up communications, opening up roadways, letting more free flow of, of people and information across the border. So it really is, is surprisingly in this world, uh, this day and age still um, uh, so isolated. 
I'm told the story is, so this beautiful uh, tower uh, was being built, um, I, don't, I don't know, the you go on these tours and there are probably a 500 if not 600 dates thrown at you that everybody in, in Uzbekistan knows by heart and uh, being a foreigner was hard to follow but the story is the ruler here uh, there was another there was another there was another uh, major city down down a ways and they had this big tower well my tower is going to be bigger than their tower and started building it and building it and building it and, and, and the day he died is when they stopped and for hundreds of years it's just stayed like that <laughs> That's fog, not smog. This is early in the morning. Um, yeah, and it will burn off. So desert climate, this is a desert climate. It gets, it can, it can, be, it can be 80 degrees difference from, from day to night. So the night will get really cold and cold air can't hold much moisture. So often in the morning when it's coldest, you, whatever moisture is in the air is, is become fog. Sun comes up, starts to warm up, and, the, and that, that, that fog disappears. Um, as I said, um, the, the new president was, was having the people come and see these glorious places, and they were in such a good mood. They wanted their picture taken all the time, um, wanted pictures. I felt like I was a movie star. <laughs> a hot man. And this, just, just like in Ta Tashkent, uh, this is in uh, Madras and Kiva. Here we have the clock of the time, the times that you're to pray during the day, the five times. And so, um, although um, I didn't feel a heavy presence of, of, of religion, you did see active, active uh, religion going on. Um, I've been in Iran, and there you feel a heavy presence of, of, of religion a lot. Um, here, a little bit. Did you hear the call to pray? I did not. Where, where other places you hear it all the time. You know, I, 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 it might have happened, but I can't remember, because I, I know when you're in, like in Cairo or other places, you hear it all the time. You become very aware of it. You know the stands, the stands, the Soviets were very, very secular. And the leader of Uzbekistan, uh, who was leader for a long time, actually imprisoned a lot of people you know, out of fear of, of, of uprisings, out of fear of, of Islamic uh, terrorists. And so, uh, although tolerated religion at one level, I think, I think that's why I didn't hear the call to prayer. I think it is, is, is been muted. And people don't, just like in China, um, although religion is, is revived, a lot of people, they, they, they grew up and their parents grew up without religion. And so I think a lot of people in this area, um, they may have some of the cultural attributes, but a lot of them grew up without religion. Um, bright colors, um, a lot of, uh, of rugs and, and tapestries. So this is um, a, uh, um, a madras, and, and the students live in these, these little rooms here. But notice the architecture, and um, this is um, along the Silk Road in the deserts of Iran. And um, this, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a, a doorway, actually the doorway is over here. Uh, you would come in, you'd have water here, you would pile all of your goods in the middle here. The people traveling on the caravan would have these rooms and, and after the, the camels ate, there's actually stalls behind here for the camels. And it would, it would be protection, and these were built by Persian architects uh, across. So, so in, in Uzbekistan, you see this Persian architecture. You see a mix of architecture, but you do see a lot of the same, same architecture um, as you see in Iran. So there's that tower. 
Um, the streets were full of people. Usually when you, go to, when you go to a tourist place, you don't want it to be crowded. But it was so much fun that, it, that, that people were in such good moods. And also, look, everybody's got kind of this, there's not a lot of fashion. This is what China looked like when I, when I first started in China in 86. Everybody wore blue and green. Very muted. And, and, and here, I saw the kind of the same, the same thing. It's just, it's just opening up. And I bet in a couple of years, it will look like uh, those images of people in Kazakhstan that have more European style. I don't know. People were just dancing <laughs> and taking picture. Yeah. Some people have cameras. I don't mean to say that everybody doesn't, but some fashion. So um, this was this was you know some party in in 1232 who was a, a prophet. And uh, this was a group from one of the villages that came to see it. And it was, I, I couldn't get in, so I just said, I'm going to sit and wait for this, this group to go by. But it, it was continuous. And um, these, three, these three women kind of turned around and, and smiled and waved. And so I took the picture. And um, I was on the uh, subway a couple weeks ago in New York City. And I saw a woman who just looked like one of them. And luckily, they asked me a question so I could say, are you from Uzbekistan? And they go, <laughs> um, it was, it definitely is, it definitely is a, 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 a facial and, and clothes wise, a unique trait, it looks like. This woman, uh, so the, the Soviets were so good about wiping out culture. She went around with some other people and tried to find old rugs and people who knew uh, various uh, uh, styles, right? Oriental or, 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 or Persian carpets and, and, and Central Asian carpets, they all have certain distinctive styles. And she was able to find and not lose some of the, the long-term styles of rugs. And she ran this woman's cooperative of um, uh, rug, rug weaving of traditional Uzbek styles. This was kind of a, a modern fashion. This, I saw this, uh, a lot of people wore this kind of uh, almost tie-dye. This is a village street, and, and here's a grave. Here's the uh, uh, well. Here's the, here's the oven, the bread oven. And you, you, you throw the, the dough inside along, along the edge. And then you, you have a mitt, and you, you pull the bread out. Some people let me take their pictures. <laughs> also, the woman on the subway had gold teeth. That was another, that was another indicator. Oh, yeah. yeah. This guy, he was a, oh. Uh, I clipped the image with, with, with the arrow on it. Um, he was so excited to see me. Uh, he has a mustache. I have a mustache. I'm a professor. He's a professor. Um, he, we had to get our picture taken. That was nice. You look more hair than you do. <laughs> <laughs> We're both hiding what we don't have. <laughs> yeah, people just wanted their picture taken. <laughs> A lot of stuff still in disrepair. They are, they are fixing stuff up. Samarkand, right, the famous place. And um, I did, I did want to read one thing briefly um, because I didn't, because the history is amazing. Samarkand, 
Merikanda to the Greeks, one of Central Asia's oldest settlements, was probably founded in the 5th century BC. It was already the cosmopolitan walled capital of Sogdian Empire when it was taken in 329 BC by Alexander the Great, who said, everything I've heard about Merikanda is true, except that it's more beautiful than I ever imagined. A key Silk Road city, it sat on the crossroads leading to China, India, and Persia, bringing in trade and artisans. From the 6th century to the 13th century, it grew into a city more populous than it is today, changing hands every couple of centuries. Western Turks, Arabs, Persians, Kazakhs, blah, 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 have all ruled here before being obliterated by Genghis Khan in 1220. Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. The, this might have been the end of the story, but in 1370, Timur decided to make Samarkand his capital. Timur was this famous you know, uniter of Uzbeks, and, and, and uh, so he decided to make, in 1370, decided to make it his capital. And over the next 35 years, forged a new, almost mythical city in Central Asia's economic and cultural epicenter. His grandson, Ugalbek, ruled until 1449 and made it an intellectual center as well. Lots of madrasas around in this place. When the Uzbek Shani bands came in the 16th century and moved their capital, capital to Bukhara, Samarkand went into decline. For several decades in the 18th century, after a series of earthquakes, it was essentially uninhabited. The emir of Bukhara forcibly repopulated the town towards the end of the century, but it was only truly resurrected by the Russians, whose force it surrendered in May 1868 and linked it to the Russian Empire. So, it is a magnificent city and it was complete, it was, it was a major city um, uh, uh, before, you know, when Alexander the Great went there. And um, it was obliterated by Genghis Khan and it was almost abandoned and it's this incredible, magnificent city. Um, there was another, another town we were at. When Genghis Khan came down to, to this part of the world, he surrounded this town, and it happened to be Ramadan. And he said, you know what? I don't attack during Ramadan. But when Ramadan is finished, I'm going to kill everybody in the city, and I'm going to destroy it. And, and when Ramadan ended, he killed everybody in the city and destroyed it. Story after story, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, those all those places were just completely destroyed. And yet, and yet, Genghis Khan 1220s. Um, anyway, my last slide is, this is back in Kazakhstan, so we are at, at Sound State in, our, in the geography department, I'm in the geography department. We have a master's program where we learn to use satellite imagery and computers and mapping. And we've got a, a program with a university in China, and we may have a program with a university in Kazakhstan. They're very interested in engaging with the West. And they would have their master's students study there one year. They would come to Salem State for a year and then go back to Kazakhstan for a year and get a degree from both, uh, both places. So that's uh, one of the products of my trip there. And that's all I've got. Are those students in the program? Uh, they're not. These are, these are the directors of the program.